Good afternoon, uh, readers. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, we're out in California. We're growing a web feet because there's so much rain. It's been raining nonstop. There's a lot. We're fine here, but uh, a lot of people are suffering in the the um, uh, the mountains and and the mountain communities and and uh, a lot of these uh, these and the LA rivers overflowing, et cetera. So it's it's tough for people. So pray for them. And uh, we, um, uh, this is Exploring God's Library, as you know, as date is Tuesday, February 6th. It's week 17. So we're, we're 17 weeks into our reading. Uh, so we're, we're not, uh, we're, we're deep in. So if you're new, you're more than welcome to join us on the journey this winter as we read through God's Library. It's revealed in this library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The discipline of Bible reading is designed to complement your study of the Bible. Uh, It's a necessary component of your daily walk with God along with fellowship in a local church. And it's very easy. Uh, We have um, in the um, uh, Exploring God's Library Facebook, private Facebook page, which I encourage you, even if you're you're listening from other places, just join the Facebook page. It's free. Uh, It's private. And um, uh, there's a lot of extra material there. I mean, a lot. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very edifying. Edifying for us, for sure. We're reading it. Also, we have, a, we have a YouTube channel, which has about, how many? Over 1,300, Over 1300 videos that are hand-selected um, that, that complement our Bible study. And uh, <clears throat> Elizabeth's been working very hard on that, putting together a... Um, a uh, an Excel chart with all the all the 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 videos. I mean, it was very interesting for me this week when I was looking for one of the videos which I include um, in, wanted to include on uh, H. B. Charles uh, preaching on on Jabez, which is uh, part of the Book of Chronicles. Um, it was very hard to find because there's so many videos there, and um, uh, but now we're trying to put it together so you can actually have like a like an index. And so, if you're looking for uh, information on on historic persons uh, or doctrines um, or you know, books of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, it's it's there. Um, many many things we spend a lot of time on that over the last five years. So, um, this is how the Bible reading program works out. It takes 20 minutes a day. You just read straight through the select passages. So, the scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are composed of 39 books widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, the Law, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the five scrolls. Remember, um, the Bible is not just a, hasn't just been a book, but it's been scrolls. And, uh, and then it's, you know, later it was uh, put into books. And so um, each day we'll be reading a, a, a portion from the Torah called the Parsha. This religious reading calendar dates back to the 6th century B.C., so it's been around a while, established during the 70-year exile of the Jewish community known as the Babylonian exile, or captivity. To this day, everyone reads from the same chapters, which makes it easier to discuss the word on a daily basis. We'll then sequentially read through a portion from the historic books and the prophets. Additionally, we'll read from the wisdom literature, uh, the psalm of the day, the same seven psalms on a weekly basis, and that day we'll cover... That way we'll cover 150 psalms twice in a year. And then we'll read one or two Proverbs, slowing down the pace so that we might you know, meditate on that passage during the day. Finally, we'll, we'll read a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. And every Tuesday evening, we'll re- review our readings and provide commentary drawn from various suggested resources. If you're not able to make it, at that time we'll post a link, and that link will be on, on, um, on our channel. It said in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And the Word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. We're going to begin with a devotional from the Valley Vision called Truth in Jesus. So if you just bow your head with me. Life-giving God, quicken us to call upon your name, and for our, uh, our mind is ignorant, our thoughts vagrant, our affections earthly, our heart unbelieving, and only your, 
you, by your spirit, can help our infirmities. We approach you as a father and a friend, our, our portion forever, our exceeding joy, our strength of heart. We believe in you as the God of nature, the ordainer of providence, the sender of Jesus, our Savior. Our guilty fear is discouraged and approach to you, but we praise you for the blessed news that Jesus reconciles you to us. May the truth that is in him illuminate in us all that is dark, establish in us that the things that are wavering, and comfort us in all that is wretched, you know, to learn to leave that, accomplish in us all that is in your goodness, and glorify in us the name of Jesus. We pass through a veil of tears, but bless you for opening the gate of glory at its, at its end. Enable us to realize as, as ours the better heavenly country. Prepare for me every part of our pilgrimage. Uphold our steps by your word. Let no iniquity dominate us. Teach us that Christ cannot be the way if I am the end. That he cannot be redeemer if I am my own savior. That there can be no true union with him while the creature, our, our fallen nature, has our heart. That faith accepts him as redeemer and Lord and or not at all. So thank you, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that um, you would guide us through these scriptures, guide us through this evening, that we would learn things, and, and that you would, by, you would guide us by your Holy Spirit and by your word. Thank you. Thank you for all these, these great teachers that have gone before us and people who are commentators, etc., for you, Lord, guiding us to all this truth. And Lord, open our ears and our eyes and our heart and our mind to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in the covenant community. And may, may everyone be blessed and may you encourage them to read um, and continue to dig into scriptures for the treasures that are so, um, so there. They're not just at the surface, but they're things that we have to dig for. So help us be disciplined and ask you for help because you are the helper that has been left with us. And you are... Is use the promise that Jesus said, even though I go away, it's going to be better for you because I'm going to leave the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to teach you. So you have a resident teacher in you, in us, the Holy Spirit. So guide us and show us the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. So why do we need the Old Testament? I do repeat this sometimes, but we're told quite clearly in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, or 6 through 13, that all the things that happened in the Old Testament became our examples and, and happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Walter Kaiser, the famous Old Testament scholar, said, the most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament is to be used and what roles it must play in the life of believers is to be found in 2 Timothy 3.16-17 in Paul's admonition to his young disciple, Timothy. He says, all scripture is God-breathed, that means Old Testament, New Testament, and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Since Paul had just finished referring to the sacred writings, it is clear that he has the Old Testament writings in mind. That was before the New Testament uh, letters were all completed. Paul urges the church to go to the Old Testament to get her doctrine and her teaching material. When the Apostle Paul arrived in one of the cities called Berea, and he taught in the synagogues, because they used to go to the synagogues before they, you know, that was the first place they would stop because they were, you know, they, they knew the Old Testament. He was introducing them to the Messiah. That they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, that's another city, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things were so. In Acts 17.11, Remember, the New Testament canon was not yet complete at that time, and so the Bereans diligently searched the Old Testament to see if what the Apostle Paul taught was according to the Scriptures. And so we should use the standard of Scripture to measure what others may teach up to us. We don't put our minds on hold as believers. We're called to love God and uh, love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. At the same time, Paul in Timothy 2.2 2 said, and the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And I hope you're doing that. I hope that when you're learning something, you, you have someone 
that you're discipling, that you're teaching them the scriptures, and and um, you know, and let let us you know, help in that work through EGL, um, and and because Paul said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now we praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Follow the tradition of the apostles and the apostles' doctrine. Today we have an entire corpus of, or the body of scriptures, so we hold dearly to them. Okay, we're going to look at the um, Exodus. Uh, Moses, and we're using, um, referencing Moses and the gods of Egypt by John J. Davis. During Moses' 40 years of exile from Egypt, he had met Jethro. Uh, and actually he's his father-in-law, and he's a priest in the land of the Midianites and married his daughter Zipporah and had two sons, Gershom, banishment reminding Moses of his first being driven out of Egypt, and Eleazar, meaning my God is help, signifying his gratitude to God for his protection in the wilderness. After his 40 years in the wilderness, Moses then called was then called by God on a special assignment to deliver the Hebrews from captivity in Egypt. He left his wife and sons in care of his father-in-law, Jethro. After God's deliverance of his precious treasure, the Hebrews, Moses traveled through the familiar territory of his exile, accompanied by over 600,000 men and women and children and all their flocks. Jethro had received news of this great deliverance and then brought Moses' wife and two sons for a great reunion with Moses. When, Mos when Jethro arrived at the encampment, because they were encamped, he was honorably received by Moses, who bowed and kissed him. Moses respected him not only as family, but for his great wisdom, as he had, had, was in many ways like Melchizedek, the priest. Jethro, having heard of the goodness and greatness of Jehovah, he rejoiced and gave praise to the God of Israel. The events of the Exodus confirmed what Jethro apparently had previously believed, namely, that the Lord was greater than all of the gods. That's according to Davis. Well, there's some leadership and administrative lessons here I want to just cover. Jethro observed that Moses sat for many hours, handling all the grievances of the Hebrews, which arose such as when they were dividing the spoils of the recently conquered Amalekites among themselves. As Jethro seized up, uh, sized up the situation, he rightly concluded that Moses could not exercise effective leadership if he were constantly bogged down with civil matters. He recommended that Moses teach them the ordinances and laws and select men to be placed over the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens in the task of administering justice to the people. The more difficult cases which others could not decide he would take up. In times of great crisis, God has always provided men to lead the way to deliverance. Moses, being raised up in the court of Pharaoh, knew how to present matters before the Pharaoh, was skilled in military matters, was well educated as a writer, was able to accurately record history, and because of his 40-year exile in the desert, was able to guide the people as God directed through this difficult desert terrain and heat, because he was basically a shepherd, and um, he knew how to shepherd. And that's just like King David. King David was a great shepherd, too. He had, he shepherded sheep, so, so but he had a shepherd's heart. Davis writes, Is this all a mere accident of history? No, indeed. The history before us is a supreme example of God's sovereign ability to accomplish his purposes for his people. Those who belong to him have every reason to be confident that that which God has promised he will fulfill. <clears throat> and so it starts in Exodus 18. Jethro gives advice um, and uh, he offers a sacrifice. He gives good counsel, which is accepted, and Jethro departs. He goes back home leaves his wife and uh, his daughter uh, and the two grandchildren. Um, one of the things that we, we posted, you'll find interesting, is uh, Ron White and the Mount Sinai YouTube. And so um, that's, that's on uh, Exploring God's Library private Facebook page. So you'll find a lot of those things on the Facebook and um, a, a private Facebook page. I encourage you, just go. I mean, it's... It, it's no big deal. It's very easy to subscribe, and then um, uh, every day you'll you'll get the um, the scripture readings. So there's also a link to the scripture because we have a calendar. If you want to print out the calendar, you can do that, or you can just get it on Exploring God's Library Facebook page. What we're trying to do is we're trying to give this so you you're 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 being paced. So we're giving you 
media material, which will give you a, a visual of what's going on there at Mount Sinai. Um, and so it's very helpful. Um, so then I've come to Exodus 20. The people are afraid of God's presence. You know, not allowed to you know go up to the mountain. You know, it's going to be um, they're they're you know they have a fence around that area. Don't go. Um, you know you know it's it's sacred sacred ground. And so then the Ten Commandments he was given there on, in Exodus twenty. And God spoke all these words, saying, "I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me." You shall not make for yourself a carved image, the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Some people say, well, you're making an image. Um, well, the images that were made of the of the uh, the angels were actually they were this was commanded by God. So they're not like you're 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 making you're you're creating something that God wants you to create. And also, you see that that um, when there was that point where people were uh, they made a put a snake on a pole for a while, uh, then they were starting to make it. Making it a an idol, they destroy it. But during that point, it was like, unless the Son of Man be lifted up, um, you know, you look upon that, and your sins will be forgiven. You'd be healed because there were people were being, being bitten by snakes. So, okay, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. Of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gate, who is within your gates. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. And um, it's not a it's not a chore. It's it's rest. God gives you rest, and. Uh, uh, and he honors that rest. It's so amazing. Uh, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And the people... Um, were really afraid of God's presence. Now the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. And they were very afraid. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be whipped before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Okay, so that's um, the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments has, there's a, a famous Puritan writer named Tom, Thomas Watson, and um, we've used uh, some of his writings uh, on the Lord's Prayer and also on some of his doctrines. But this is actually from uh, his work. It's called the Ten Commandments. I'm just going to read some of the things that said, God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Exodus 21 through 2. God spoke all these words. This is like the sounding of a trumpet before a solemn proclamation. Maybe you've never heard that, but um, it would be like um, very very loud announcing to all the people what's going on. Um, Other parts of the Bible are said to be uttered by the mouth of the holy prophets. But here God speaks, spoke in his own person. Observe this. Number one, the lawgiver, God spoke. And um, you know, we're, when we're reading the word of God, we're reading his very words from the mouth of God. These are two things requisite to a lawgiver. 
One, the lawgiver law must have wisdom. Laws are founded upon reason, and he must be wise who makes laws. God, in this respect, is most fit to be a lawgiver. He is wise in heart. In Job 9.4, he has a monopoly of wisdom. The only wise God, 1 Timothy 1.17, therefore he is fittest to enact and constitute laws. Second, authority. If a subject makes laws, however wise they may be, they lack the stamp of authority. God has the supreme power in his hand. He gives being to all, and he who gives men their lives has the most right to give them their laws. The law itself, all these words, that is, the words of the moral law, which is usually styled the Decalogue. Decalogue is also, uh, where we get the word de decapolis. Um, deca means ten. You know, they're like up in the Sea of Galilee, there were ten Greek cities. You know, when you, we, we read about the... Um, the area where there was the uh, the demoniac, they they actually were um, raising pigs, which was an unclean unclean animal. Jews were raising them, and that's when the the pigs went into the ocean, they were cast in the sea, and the the demoniac was freed from his from the oppression of these demons that were in him. Um, well, that's in De Decalogue ten. Okay, that which um, the Ten Commandments. It's called the moral law because it is the rule of life and morality. The scriptures, as Christensen, an early church father, says, it is a garden. The moral law is the chief flower in it. It is a banquet, and the moral law is the chief dish in it. The moral law is perfect. And it says in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. It is an exact model and platform of true religion. It is a standard of truth, the judge of controversies, the pole star to direct us to heaven. The commandment is a lamp. It is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And in Proverbs 6, 23, though the moral law is not a Christ to justify us, it is a rule to instruct us. You know, we're not saved by the law, but we're convicted by the law. The moral law is unalterable. It, rem it still remains in force. Uh, through the ceremonial and judicial laws are, are abolished by official formal action. They're no longer there. Because we don't, uh, we're not doing sacrifices in the temple, so we don't do those kind of those kind of laws. But we do follow moral law, which like don't lie, don't steal, steal, don't you know, and keep the Lord uh, God's name. Don't take the Lord God God's name in vain. The moral law is delivered by God's own mouth. It is a perpetual use in the church. It was written in tables of stone to show its per uh, perpetuity, so its longevity. The moral law is very illustrious and full of glory. God put glory upon it in the manner of its promulgation. In other words, how it was made known publicly, um, proclaimed it, you know, it's doctrine and law. It's a very public uh, event. Um, the people before the moral law was delivered were to wash their clothes, whereby as a type, God required the sanctifying of their ears and hearts to receive the law. Two, there were, there were bounds that were set that none might touch the mountain, which was to produce in the people, reverence of the law. We should have fear and reverence of God's word. Um, that's Exodus 19.12. God spoke the law with his own finger, which was such an honor put upon the moral law, as we read of no other such writing. And God, by some mighty operation, made the law legible in letters, as if it had been written with his own finger. So it's directly from God. And then, God putting the law in, in the ark to be preserved, because they had an ark, and so they put it in the ark along with some other things. It was a s signal mark of honor put upon it. The ark was a cabinet in which he put the Ten Commandments as ten jewels. At the delivery of the moral law, many angels were in attendance. Deuteronomy 33, 2. A parliament of angels was called, and God himself was, in, was the speaker. Use 1. Here we may notice God's goodness, who has left us not without law. He often sets down the giving of his commandments as a demonstration of his love. It's like um, you want laws. I mean, you know, do we need laws? Well, if you're driving across a city you know, or going on freeways, uh, you definitely want stoplights and, and traffic lights you know, to, to direct your traffic. I mean, laws are very important. He has not dealt with any other nation and as for his judgments, they have not known them. You gave them true laws, good statutes, and commandments. So this is really a gift from God. 
Um, what a strange creature would be man if he had no laws to direct him. There would be no living in the world. We would have, have not none born but Ishmael's. Every man's hand would be against his neighbor. Man would grow wild if he had not affliction to tame, tame him and no moral law to guide him. You need, you need police, you need authority. And uh, that's God's law. It's, it's actually uh, to guide us and to protect us. I mean, I don't know if you ever had a blackout in your area and you have to cro cross town. I have. Very difficult with many, many lights out. Everybody's doing their own thing. The law of God is a hedge to keep us within the bound, bonds of sobriety and piety. Use two. If God spoke all these words of the moral law, then it condemns. One. God spoke all these words of the moral law, then it condemns these other sects of, um, uh, that try to do something different, the Marcionites, the Manichees, who speak lightly and blasphemy of the moral law, who says it is below Christian. It is carnal, which the apostle confutes when he says, the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. In Romans 7.14, if God spoke all these words of the moral law, then it condemns the antinomians. What does that mean? People against law. They don't, oh, I, I don't need law. I'm, I'm above the law. No. Um, it condemns them, antinomians, who will not admit the moral law to be a rule to a believer. We do not say that he is under the curse of the law, but it is a standard, but commands of the law. We do not say the moral law is a Christ, but it is a star to lead to Christ. We do not say that it saves, but it sanctifies our life. Those who cast God's law behind their backs, God will cast their prayers behind his back. Those who will not have the law to rule them, they shall have the law to judge them. You're going to get judged by a law. You don't follow the law. Just like, okay. And um, I'm using this from, this is a, um, a book on, uh, on, on America and the laws in America. And it says, law from a Christian perspective, and as the founders of America viewed it, originates in the will of God, revealed in general to man through nature and his conscience, and more specifically in its revelation of the scriptures. Law from a humanistic view is rooted in man, ultimately autonomous man, but practically in the state, and the consensus of the majority over a powerful minority. From a biblical perspective, man is fallen and fallible. You can sure see that in America now, right? Um, Whoever is in control, this powerful minority, you know, starts to change things. So it's not based upon the Constitution, nor based upon the laws of God. And the biblical purpose of civil law is to restrain the evil action of men in society. True law reveals what is good, right and wrong, and hence exposes law breakers. But law in itself cannot produce what is right. It cannot change the heart or attitude of man. Therefore, the Christian acknowledges the inability to, to legislate good or make people moral by passing laws. Or some would say, you cannot legislate morality. However, the Christian recognizes the moral basis of all laws. All laws everywhere are based upon the moral presuppositions of the lawmakers. Laws against murder reflect a moral belief in the intrinsic dignity of man as made in the image of God. That's why, you know, we don't, you know, the abortion is not something that we would believe in because it goes against the laws of God. That baby is made in the image of God, and so it's protected. All law has a moral concern. The important question, though, however, to the Christian, is whose morality does it legislate? And often it depends upon the state you're in or the, or the justice system you're under. So that's, that's the fundamental battle. Humanists see the evils in, evils in society and in man, but explain them differently than Christians. To the humanist, there is no higher being than man. So man is... You know, we'll do whatever he wants. To them, there is no incarnate Savior. From a humanistic perspective, there is no hope of internal regeneration to save man. Therefore, any salvation or transformation to save man must come from man. That's a, you know, it's a, that's not a great hope. Um, I mean, it depends upon who your who who your your master is, right? And you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one. Therefore, any salvation or transformation to save man must come from man. Historically, man has tended to use the instrument of law and government to attempt to bring such a transformation or salvation. Yeah, prison, prison reforms, psychologists, uh, those kind of things. 
They believe only by force of law that evil will be eliminated and utopia established on earth. And that has proven um, to be untrue. From a Christian perspective, law can restrain sinful man from acting evilly for the fear of punishment as a deterrent, but he cannot be changed by law. Um, and, and so and you see that uh, if someone goes out and has a, gets a DUI or something like that or kills somebody, it's like, you know, um, they can know the law, but they don't do it because their sinful nature is overwhelming. Unless the evil heart of man is changed, where will we be? There will be no advancement towards a better society. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The heart, in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. The gospel of Jesus Christ can transform man's heart. The heart of man is deceitful in all his ways. So he knows our heart. Okay, we're going to now look at uh, the book of Chronicles. And uh, we're in chapter 1 through 11, so it's one of the first times. Um, in, in 169, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Second Chronicles 169. What? According to the theologian Andrew Hill, this is a, we're using the, his commentary on the book of Chronicles, it retells the story of the Davidic kingship in ancient Israel, its rise and its fall. The story is a theology of hope for a despairing Jewish community, which returned to Judah following their 70 years in exile in Babylon. To read the Bible as literature means that we understand the book of Chronicles as a story of human experience and a commentary on the great issues of life, asking such questions as, what really exists? What is good and bad behavior? What really matters and what matters most? Unlike Shakespeare's King John, who lamented that life is as tedious as a twice-told tale, the author of Chronicles encourages us to enter his retelling of Israelite history like Bunyan's pilgrim um, named Hopeful. This fellow, fellow traveler became hopeful by observing the behavior and listening to the speech of Christian and faithful during the sufferings at the fair. Like Hopeful, our encounter with the faithful of God portrayed in Chronicles should prompt us to love a holy life and long to do something for the honor and glory of the name of the Lord Jesus that son of David, whom the Chronicles long to see. So then, let the pilgrimage to the Chronicle begin. So, who? What is Chronicles? Chronicles is a story about God who chooses one nation to bless all nations. A people banished from God, God's promised land, because of sin and rebellion, but restored to that privileged position by his gracious response to their repentance and renewed faith. What is history? According to Burke Long, history is an extensive and continuous written composition based on source materials and devoted to a particular subject on or time period. Chronicles is a secondary history written by anonymous Levite um, or priest as Ezra, Nehemiah, or Esther, containing a rich collection of literary types, genealogies, eyewitness accounts, written records, and scriptures, as did Luke in the book of Luke and Acts. The book of Chronicles is is like a sermon in nature, meaning one which preaching occurs about written or oral addresses, prayers, prophecies under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, encouraging a right relationship between God and people. Now remember, um, in the, the captivity, a lot of people, tribes came from, all, there are 12 tribes, but these tribes were in different areas and they kind of all had to come there. And so Ezra was collecting these writings. And so we're going to go through that a little bit. Um, so these, these were done under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, encouraging a right relationship between God and his people. His primary purpose, much like uh, um, in Exodus, I mean, Exodus was, remember, the, the Jews came out of Egypt, and they were under slavery for many years, so they, they brought the, it took a while to get the slave out of the, the slaver, the person who was enslaved. So that's why he was they're wandering in the desert for so long. His primary purpose is to tell the story of God in history, his sovereign rule as creator, the election of Israel, 
It is a public chronicle of the absolute sovereignty and faithfulness of the eternal God as his chosen community of faith, calling them to worship. And then uh, one of the, there's a lot of treasures in here. So, um, you know, when you first come into looking at uh, Chronicles, you feel like, oh man, I mean, this is why a lot of people stop reading the Bible, quite frankly, because they get so tired of it. So many genealogies, oh man, this is forever. Well, you can actually, and we have mentioned this before, that um, you can you know, look at uh, your YouTube, and sometimes we'll, we'll put it up there. We'll have um, uh, a reader, like um, um, it's a famous, um, famous man who, who reads the Bible, um, Alexander Scorby, and, um, and we'll put in the, you know, the chapters, and this you can actually hear him read the scriptures and you know, hear, the, hear the names. And so you start to get used to the names and you'll start to say them over. So usually we'll play it and then and repeat the names. But um, uh, the treasures are, are, are incredible. So, um, and one of the things we shared is uh, the prayer of Jabez. Oh, wow. And, uh, and a, a famous uh, preacher, H.B. Uh, Charles, I mean, I listened to it again. I've listened to it several times. And uh, so that's posted on Exploring God's Library Facebook page. And I highly recommend listening to it. I mean, it's, to me, it was very encouraging and very convicting. And uh, he talks about the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign. He has an unimpeachable jurisdiction over everything. God is God, is God all by himself. That's that doctrine of aseity, which means God doesn't need us. Uh, we need God. Okay, God doesn't need us to feed him, etc. God has everything under his control. Because God is sovereign, you must simply ask, trust, and obey, and thank God no matter what. If you are in Christ, you are already blessed. Chronicles are written during the Babylonian exile of the Jews who were in captivity. Ezra, the priest, began collecting genealogies written by each tribe which had been dispersed. His audience knew the stories of David's infidelity with of Bathsheba. They didn't need to be reminded of that. What they needed most was hope. Reminders of God's word to the house of David from Nathan um, in 2 Samuel 7, 16 and in Kings. And this is a very hopeful verse. I mean, um, I'll read this. Chronicles gives us facts about Israelite history, names, dates, places, events, and so on. But this two-volume book is also connected, is also a connected narrative, a story, if you will. Chronicles is a story about God who chooses one nation to bless all nations. Chronicles is about a people banished from God's promised land because of sin and rebellion, but restored to that privileged position by his response to their repentance and renewed faith. According to C.S. Lewis, a good story leaves things which it did not, where it did not find them. Chronicles is a good story because it finds the Hebrews in exile in Babylonia, but leaves the Hebrews regathered in Jerusalem. And Judah, according to the word of the Lord, spoken by Jeremiah the prophet and orchestrated by the God of heaven. Or so it was that the children of Israel sinned against the Lord, their God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods. And that's a really danger for, for anyone who's, okay, we're really, we're really blessed by God, but they forget God from whom the blessings come, Right? And they walked in the statues of the nations, and they were, were not supposed to imitate the detestable practices of the nations. So why did he? That, that's why the um, the kings were required when they became a king to write the scriptures by hand, so they knew what God was saying in His Word. But many of them failed to do so. And so the. They, they imitate the nations, and they walked in statutes of the nations from whom the God had cast out, cast out from the before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which they had made. Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves the sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. 
and they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, of which the Lord has said to them, You shall not do this thing. That Ten Commandments, right? Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets. Every seer, seer like a prophet, sees ahead, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected the statutes and his covenant that they had made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he had testified against them. They followed idols. And his testimonies which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them. Followed and... Um, and concerning whom the Lord had charged them, their God made for themselves a molded image and two calves made a wooded, wooden image and worship all the hosts of heaven and serve Baal. This is a problem even with like immigration in any nation, any time. It's like you you mix with. That's why you have to be separate. It's like you get mixed with the, you know, like in 1965, you had most of your immigrants came from from Asia, 65 percent, and so. That, what do they bring with them? Brought Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam. And so people started to practice other religions. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Also, Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord, their God, but walked in the walked in the statue of Israel which they had made. And the Lord rejected all the sins of Israel, afflicted them, and delivered them into the, ban, the hand of plunderers till he cast them out from his sight. Sound familiar? For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. And you see a lot of that going on. The, you know, the people become people like priests or people like their leaders. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, and they did not depart from them. Till the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, and he said to, he said by all his servants the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land uh, to Assyria as it is to this day. The story is told as a theology of hope, the Chronicles, for a despairing Jewish community in post-exile Judah. The author rehearses Israel's past as proof of positive that God's promises are utterly reliable. The stories of kings like David, Solomon, Hezekiah, and Josiah are surety of sorts for that long-awaited righteous branch will indeed sprout for David's line. Hope is always in vogue. Indeed, hope springs eternal for fallen people in a fallen world, never more than, than now. The moral bankruptcy of a con consumer culture, the oppression and persecution of millions in the name of religion, the failure of humanistic philosophy in education and politics, the devaluation of human life in the form of state-sponsored infanticide, which we see, and the emerging and present threat of global terrorism make our world a rather grim place to live. It is in this context that the Christian church waits the second advent of the righteous branch, the son of David. In so doing, we embrace Paul's exhortation, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope through the encouragement of the written in the past to teach us in Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Remember, they're, they're, they're for our learning for whom the ends of the ages have come. So what is a chronicle? It is a literary form, a prose composition of a series of reports or selected events in the third person style arranged and dated in chrono chronological order. So you have genealogies, that's you're going through a lot of genealogies, and then you know you're reading about um, you know the the priests, you're reading about you know the, the tribes, the etc. So you're getting a list or catalog of these things. And of course, if you are thinking about them in genealogies in terms of your own family. You start to understand a little bit. Okay, these people really, these are very important, and um, so um, 
and it's also important as a distinctive in uh, understanding um, things. In Second Chronicles, uh, you have letters. In Second Chronicles 36 through 9, it says, At the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials, which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your parents, their fellow Israelites, who are unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so they made an object of horror, as you see. Do not be stiff-necked, as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. And it's not... And remember, even in Samaria, they were... They were they worship calves there. They're, they're calf gods, and they're because they wouldn't go to uh, Jerusalem, um, where you're commanded to go to Jerusalem three times a year. Serve the Lord your God, so that His fierce anger will turn away from you. So it was very the formula is that God had specific rules, and uh, if you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate; He will not turn His face from you if you return to Him. These are promises. I pray that uh, in more of the, the Jewish community um, actually remembers those promises. Amen. Okay, First Chronicles um, 17. Uh, then the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Yet his, this was a small thing in your sight, O God, and you have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree. God had honored his own people. O Lord God, what more can David say to you? For the honor of your servant, for you know your servant. O Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness in making known all these great things. O Lord, there is none like you. So they're, they're encouraged. They're, they're remembering. Okay, you have, God has made a promise. And through Nathan, Prophet, O oh Lord, there is none like you, and nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds? Okay, we're, in, we're, not, we're not back in the Red Sea, but there were great and awesome deeds. What about in Gaza? Great and awesome deeds. God can do, still do. And this is... These are the things that we have scriptures to remind us of these things. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds, by driving out nations from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt. For you made your people Israel your own people forever, and your Lord have, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house let it be established forever and do as you have said. Let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. Let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house your servant, and may continue before you, and it, here's the word, forever. Well, you can't have a place if you're going to destroy it with a nuclear bomb or have all these confederacy of nations. And I did uh, post some things on um, the Psalm 83 war, and um, uh, Walter Kaiser and another person, I think it's very instructive and very encouraging, by the way. Okay, so what are the things that are, are, are found in... in, um, in Chronicles, speeches or sermons, prophetic revelation, they found there in there. Uh, songs, and there's David's song of thanksgiving. On that day, David first delivered the psalm in the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of his wondrous works. Glory is his name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. Oh, his wonders and judgments of his mouth. Remember those 185,000 um, 
troops of Sennacherib that were destroyed in one night by one angel. Come on. O seed of Israel, his servant, your children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in the earth. Remember his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. He gave him the land of Canaan for their inheritance. So other people are trying to steal. Of course Satan wants to steal the land that God has given. Of course he does. But God is in control, not Satan. We have to get that right. God is in control. God is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Satan can't be everywhere. So we have to have that faith and confidence in his word and the deeds that he's already done. They went from one nation to another and from one kingdom to another people. He per permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above, of, above all gods. Above all gods. And these... these um, you know, this, this Hamas, they have underground gods. They, they live underground. They're like, they're like, like, they're just evil. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give the Lord, O families of the peoples, give the Lord glory and strength. Give the Lord their glory due to his name. Bring an offering in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. The world is also firmly established, you shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let their sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord, for he's coming to judge the earth. He's coming to judge the earth. Isn't that amazing? He's coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures what? Forever. And say, save us, O God, of our salvation. Gather us and deliver us from the Gentiles. And give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. So it said that this combination of literary forms and well-developed plot structure of the two books confirmed Chronicles as a work of considerable artistic merit. It has that theology of hope. And the writer assumes the reader's working knowledge of the earlier Hebrew histories. This allows the compiler carefully and deliberately to select only those segments that have direct bearing on the religious life of the Israelite community or promote the theology of hope the chroniclers are in intended to convey. Well, um, that was Second Samuel also, uh, seven, twelve through 17. Your kingdom, in your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, according to all the visions, so David, Nathan spoke to David. Um, so, w what was happening in other places of the world at this time, where the Chronicles were written? The founder of Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama, was born, okay, the, well, the actual history addressed in Chronicles spans the Hebrew monarchy from the close of Saul's reign to the Babylonian captivity of Judah. That was 1020 to 546 BC. So Buddhism, uh, the founder of Buddhism, Gautama, was born in 563 BC into a wealthy family. Uh, Gautama rejected his life and riches and embraced a lifestyle of asceticism, extreme self-discipline. After 49 consecutive days of meditation, the Buddha of uh, Gautama became the Buddha, or enlightened one. When was Confucius and Buddha? He was born in the state of Lu in the middle of the 6th century BC. In this time, the philosopher Carl Jaspers was famously called the Axial Age. This was a time not only of Confucius, but of Plato, the Buddha, Zoroaster, and the Hebrew prophets. So it's kind of a, that's kind of gives you a setting of history, looking around the world, what's going on. So a lot going on. Okay, well, uh, moving right along, we've gone th so we go through the 11 Chronicles, and so a lot of 
a lot of things going on. I'm um, looking at the chronology of people. And then I did mention the prayer of Jabez, H.B. Charles. highly recommend that. Um, and then I'm just going to look in a, a little bit in the reflections on the Gospel of John. And looking at uh, John 14, I also posted something on a uh, sermon on John 14, which I think is really interesting. Because the upper room discourse, which is only spoken of in the Gospel of John, not the other Gospels. The Lord's last night with his disciples is a moment unlike any other moment. He seals the promises with a prayer which seals those promises to his disciples and all of us who follow him. Now, this is his love to his disciples. It contains two of the darkest moments when Judas betrays Christ and hangs himself, ends up in hell, and Peter, who denies Christ three times, ends up in repentance and, and you know, the birth of the church in Pentecost. And this is a really powerful chapter in the Gospel of John. Don't let your heart be troubled. Remember, he's, he's, this is a very difficult time for the disciples because he's, um, he, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving you now. And where I'm going, you can't come. And they're like really troubled because they've been living and they gave up everything and they, 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 they don't have any comfort. I mean, Jesus is with them all the time. You're, you're, it's that you're next to Jesus day in and day out. And you're seeing him doing miracles. He is the provider. And, um, and, but he's telling them, I'm going to go. Don't let your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And so these are very comforting words. And, and it's a very interesting um, sermon. I, I highly recommend it. It's very encouraging, as is H.P. Uh, Charles. I mean, I'm super, super encouraged this week. And um, thank you for letting me serve you this way. Okay, so um, there are a lot of things that are going on in the Gospel of John. Um, the empty tomb and you know, the etc. I also have something from um, uh, from Simon Greenleaf. He's a he's kind of our um, historic figure of the week. Simon Greenleaf. Uh, Help found Harvard. He is the one of the principal founders of Harvard Law School, which is gone, gone now. But as a reason, set out to disprove the biblical testimony concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And he was certain that a careful examination of the internal witness of the Gospels would dispel all the myths at the heart of Christianity. But this legal scholar came to the conclusion that the witnesses were reliable, and that the resurrection did in fact happen. He's an important figure in the development of the Christian school of thought known as legal or jur, jurid, juridical, juridical apologetics. A school of thought is typified by legally trained scholars applying the canons of legal proof and judicial arguments in defense of Christian belief. He has, um, and I, I posted this too, the testimony of the evangelists. He set a model for many Subsequent works by legal apologists, and I read it last night. Ugh, it's powerful. I mean, I couldn't. It's very, very slow reading because it's a lot of legal stuff. But um, I'm. You you see the impeccability, or the in, unimpeachability of the witnesses that uh, Jesus had in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. It's just amazing. Um, and so I highly encourage that. Okay, well, um, it's a brilliant attorney looking at the testimony of four witnesses, their qualifications and background, their unimpeachable integrity as why witnesses of the life and miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Leaves no room for doubt upon the examination of their lives and testimonies about the life of Jesus Christ. It is certain upon the examination of these four witnesses' testimony that there was no collusion between their testimonies as their styles and choices in telling the story um, their lives and eyewitnesses from four diverse backgrounds. As Matthew, the tax collector, who, who intimately worked with the Roman government, I mean, he 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 wasn't he, he's not going to get fooled, you know, by by people. Um, and Luke, the physician, whose language and training as a physician allowed him to identify the miracles of Jesus. I mean, he, you know, I see the man with the the um, the withered hand, or I I see the woman, you know, that's um, 
leaking blood for 12 years. They spent all of her money on, 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 on doctors. Um, so you see these things and you go, I mean, who else could have been around at that time? What other witness? It's like Luke is perfect. You know, he's a, you know, Dr. Luke. So anyway, that's, um, that kind of gives you that. Well, um, don't forget um, some of the resources that are available. Ron Wyatt and Mount Sinai. Uh, H.P. Charles, The Prayer of Jabez. You'll love it. You really will love it. And um, the memory verse is, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And the prophecy, in, a, in Old Testament prophecy 22.16, they pierced his hands and his feet. New Testament, John 19.18. And one of the hymns this week is A Man of Sorrows with a, with a name with a God. Who, that's such a great psalm. And uh, so there's a story about that psalm too, or song, that song. So I think you'll find it interesting. All right, well, um, I just want to encourage you, you know, to keep reading. Um, you know, I know it's kind of tough going through, um, through Chronicles, but I think that some of this information will help you understand it a little bit better. I also did some things which uh, there was a, something from um, uh, the Bible Project which did a couple uh, charts which gives you a picture of, of Chronicles, gives you a little bit better um, bird's eye view. And, um, well, let's close in prayer. God enjoyed. You are the in incomprehensible but prayer-hearing God, known but beyond knowledge, Revealed but unrevealed. Our wants and welfare draw us to you, for you never said, seek me in vain. To you we come in our difficulties, our health problems, necessities, our distresses. Possess us with yourself, with a spirit of grace and supplication, with a prayerful attitude of mind, with access into warmth of fellowship, so that in the ordinary concerns of our life and thoughts and desire, desires may rise to you. In a habitual devotion, we may find resource that you... You soothe our sorrows, sanctify our successes, qualify us in our ways for dealings with our fellow man. We bless you that you have made us capable of knowing you, the author of all being, of resembling you, the perfection of all excellency, of enjoying you, the source of all happiness. O oh God, attend to us in every part of our arduous and trying pilgrimage. We need the same counsel, defense, comfort we found at our beginning. Let our religion be more obvious to our conscience and more perceptible to those around. Well, Jesus is presenting, representing us in heaven. May we reflect him on earth. Will it please our cause? May we show forth his praise. Continue the gentleness of your goodness towards us. And whether we wake or sleep, let your presence go with us and your blessing attend us. You have led us on and have found your promises true. We've been sorrowful, but you have been our help, even you know, our, our physical maladies, Lord. Fearful, but you have delivered us. Despairing, but you have lifted us up. Your vows are ever upon us. And we praise you, O oh God. Thank you. And Lord, we pray for those that are suffering um, through storms right now and the flooding. Be with them and teach them to know you and to love you. And Lord, may the fear of God be released in this country that we may return to you. And Lord, we pray for all those that that are in prison in our country from January 6th. We also pray those that are, that are um, trying to set an example um, over the borders that are 750,000 truckers and others that are together. We pray that you draw them to you, Lord. And may all glory and honor go to you. And Lord, we pray for those that are coming across our borders if they that you would foil their plans. Um, and if they are coming because you brought them, that we would, we would um, the gospel would be preached to them. And Lord, we pray that our government would turn back to you. And we pray for uh, President Trump. We pray for those who are running for office. They protect them. We don't need, we don't want um, evil to happen to these men. We pray confound the plans. And we pray that, that uh, Congress or Senate would release funds for Israel's you know, weapons to defect, uh, to protect them. And we pray that during this time that, um, I mean, Israel 
it has become the head and not the tail. And the U.S. has kind of lost its way spiritually. We pray that you draw us back to you. In Jesus' name, thank you. We pray also for those that are having physical problems or their health needs to be strengthened. You strengthen, strengthen Ivan, uh, strengthen other friends that um, have physical issues and um, help them um, guide their paths and, and give them hope, that strong hope and confidence and courage to finish well the race that's set before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good, good week. Be careful. <laughs>